point study and we're continuing our study on the line of the three kings plus one so can we begin with an opening prayer dear father in heaven we are thankful for the time that we have here this morning we invite your spirit to instruct us and uh, we are thankful for the light that you've been giving us so we ask that we can understand this light, that we can walk in it and obey your voice. And um, we pray, Lord, that uh, the things we learn will affect our lives and that others around us can be affected as well. May your Holy Spirit be here now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been looking at uh, verse 2. Now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So we know that this then is a prophecy. And um, when it says, I will show thee the truth, that that has to do with what's in the scripture of truth. So the preceding uh, chapter ends with a verse. And that verse says, behold, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And so we know that this refers to in the scriptures, what we find in Ezra chapter four. Yet in Ezra chapter 4, that's going to be written later. At least it's events that are going to occur later. So this is actually a prophecy about what's going to be in the scriptures. And I don't know if we fully resolved what that means. Um, but we, we could say that within the scriptures, that truth is revealed in this pattern that we see so when he says behold there shall stand up yet three kings in persia we see this pattern this three one combination and the fourth shall be far richer than they all and so what we've done so far as drawn we've drawn these kings on a line and we're examining this so we have here um, the time of the end is going to be marked by the first king that arrives. So that means there's this prophecy. It's pointing to these three kings, Cambyses, Balsmertus, and Darius. We spent a little bit of time looking at Cambyses, um, you know, when he reigned. And uh, uh, we're just gonna look at that briefly again. And we looked a bit at Balsmertus. We're gonna look at that again. Uh, we know that he reigns for seven months, and then it's going to be um, on the 10th day of the seventh month on the Babylonian calendar, that's September 29th, 522 BC, that uh, Balsmertus will be killed and Darius becomes the king of Persia. And we can see how when we laid these out with events in our history, that is, we lined up Cambyses with Clinton, we can see that the formalization and empowerment would be these events. Uh, the World Trade Center bombing on February 26th, 1993, followed by Waco two days later. And then, um, uh, so that's going to be, and, and I think if I remember correctly, it's actually, um, I think so. 28th so you're going to have it's going to be on april 19th that uh that waco is going to burn i'm just trying to remember the number of days uh, here so just hang on a second if i can remember this um so we got So in 1993, we had the World Trade Center bombing. 
And that becomes overshadowed, even though it was huge news, it becomes overshadowed by uh, the events of Waco. So, and. 50 days? Yeah, I think it's 50 days. Yeah. So it's 50 days. So it's 50 days. So that's like a Pente uh, Pentecost between the start of Waco and the end uh, sort of thing. 52 days from the World Trade Center bombing to uh, the burning of, of the compound at Waco. Okay. So, so I mean, we, we could just put in there from these two events, 52 days. To, um, so I'll put the dates in here. Just we're marking the end date of Waco. So this is going to be. This will be. Okay. Does that give us any information, these symbols here, as far as the first angel's message, uh, its formalization and empowerment? I think it adds to what we've been addressing it's interesting that this was 52 days right because i mean that's isn't that similar to the the time with nehemiah building the wall yeah that's the 52 days of nehemiah building the wall that that's correct so we have that symbol the 52 right um We also have an April 19th symbol. And we have uh, February 26th is 622 in reverse. So we have we have symbols here that that we have addressed in other places, right? I mean, we have the 10th day of the seventh month as well over there with the rise. So, and, and, and it falls in the right place as far as being the third angel's message arriving, if we're comparing this to October 22. So, so we have lots of symbols here that, that you know, we're not going to just ignore. We're, we're, we don't know exactly what they mean or how to interpret them particularly. But we know that these are symbols. Now we have um, a couple of things that I wanted to look at just to sort of clarify this history. Um, let's see if we can get this. So with Cambyses. Um, just we know that he um, he at first when Babylon was overthrown, but he, that the following year his father is going to place him in charge of Babylonian affairs. Um, so he does the ritual duties of a Babylonian king in the important New Year festival in 530. Um, BC, so about eight years later. Um, and uh, that's going to be the year that his father dies. And so um, 
It says, then the conquest of Egypt planned by Cyrus was the major achievement of Cambyses' reign. The invasion took place during the reign of Samtik III, that's the, uh, the Egyptian pharaoh. Cambyses received assistance from Polycrates of Samos, from Phanes, a Greek general in the Egyptian army, who gave him valuable military information, and from the Arabs who provided water for the crossing of the Sinai Desert. After Cambyses had won the Battle of Pelusium in 525 in the Nile Delta and had captured Heliopolis and Memphis, Egyptian resistance collapsed. So another thing that we can look at then with Cambyses is we can see in 525 the conquering of Egypt. Now, some people put 526, so um, there's always little disagreements between scholars about these dates. But can we place the conquering of Egypt here with Cambyses? Can we parallel it with um, this history as well? So 525 being a symbol, Would we just take that 525 and connect it to that 252 as a symbol? Would that, that be the most? Um, so we got you know, these events in the United States in our history, but we have 525 with Cambyses. So, so maybe if I put this down here, this down here. You understand what I'm saying? Um, no. Okay. So we have events in our history. Right. Trade Center bombing and Waco, and we have the symbol of 52 days. But in Cambyses' history, we have Egypt conquered in 525 BC. Can we connect these symbols together, the, the 525 BC and um, Cambyses, with, in, with Cambyses, with this 52 days? Does 525 and 52 have a relationship with each other? Yeah, so it's the same numbers, right? The five and the two. And, and now what is Egypt? The conquering of Egypt, what is that suggesting here? Because we know Babylon's the king of the north. And Egypt is the king of the south. Right, from the perspective of those in Israel. So how do we understand Cambyses conquering Egypt? Is it significant? It's a symbol that's going to have to be considered for what we're looking at here, because if Cambyses is, is conquering Egypt, is this a foreshadowing of the loss of rights in America because of what happened with Waco and the World Trade Center? Okay, so so explain more. Well, <clears throat> it's because of the World Trade Center bombing that when 9-11 occurred, that there was such a rush to begin removing rights, such as, you know, the Patriot Act. Okay. Waco, again, because of 
the way in which Waco was being addressed has opened the consciousness of many that small groups such as what was happening at Waco need either to be severely controlled or destroyed, which is a forerunner to a Sunday law. Okay. So, so with Egypt being conquered, how do we tie that specifically then? Symbolically, haven't we looked at Egypt being the world? Okay. And the king of the north being Babylon. Correct. That's spiritual Babylon. Right. Okay. So, so this, this fits in, um, you know, if we're going to put this in our history, uh, this first angel arriving... I mean, this is in the time of Clinton. This isn't uh, 1989, right? Because we're zooming into this history. We know that, that, that this is a zoom in on some way mark on a line above it. Um, Clinton isn't there in 1989. So Clinton then is there in 92, right? And it's going to be in his first year of reign that these events occur, right? Right. So, so the significance of that, right, is that, you know, we have in Clinton, he comes into power, we have these major events. And then when Bush comes into power, again, we have these major events with each of these kings. And so, so with Cambyses, we have this symbol of Egypt being conquered in 525. And that would have to tie us to that 52 days as a symbol. So we don't have two events that we're marking in Cambyses history. We just have the one, but it symbolizes those two. Okay, so it, are we satisfied with this Cambyses paralleling this history of Clinton? Does it appear to have connections? We would have to say yes, right? I would say that this has to have some connection. Yeah, okay. Okay, so then... Um, the other one I want to address is false murders. Um, so we're going to look at that history. Now, this is um, a footnote in a paper on uh, uh, Darius the Mede. I'll just let you see this here. So, it's rather long footnote. Okay. Now, uh, the Behustin inscription, this is that inscription uh, that was made by Darius. And I'll show this to you again. Maybe we just looked at it. So before we read this, we'll just look at this picture. So this is this inscription. It's made about uh, 520 BC by Darius. And it, it gives the history of, of uh, the Persian Empire at that time, specifically Darius's own history. So it's a, an autobiography. And so this is um, this is the document where we would um, we would understand that Darius is uh, the rightful king, and and this is where we get the story about false murders is from this the Houston inscription. So we're going to read a bit about this. So it says, according to the inscription, that's the inscription. Cambyses secretly murdered his full brother, Bardia, in 526 or early 525. So, um, and this, so this is going to be during this time when they have um, uh, and then left Persia to launch his invasion, invasion of Egypt. So you're going to see that that's connected with the invasion of Egypt. 
which happens in 525. So, so we could even put in there uh, the murder of Bardia in connection with the invasion of Egypt. We could even say that one is connected to the other. So we could have, you know, 526 and then 525. But anyway, uh, so the, but it's probably at the same time. It's so I, and I'm taking 525 as the symbol. He then left Persia to launch his invasion in Egypt in early 522. While Cambyses was still in Egypt, a member of the Magi named Gomata launched a revolt on the basis of a, a false claim to be Bardia, whose murder was not publicly known. Now, this is this is what has always been believed for a long, long time until very modern times that they have this other theory, which we're going to look at. It's called the hoax theory, but we'll see how that is. So. So a false claim to be Bardia, whose murder was not publicly known. So when you say he's called false Smyrtus, is actually this Smyrtus is just another name that was given. He's really false Bardia, right? Um, and this guy is then Gamata, Gaumata. So Gaumata quickly gained control over the empire, and Cambyses died in Syria in a freak accident as he was returning to do battle with Gamata. So after Darius and six other nobles discovered that Gamata was not actually Bardia, they formed a conspiracy against him. Gamata and his followers were killed, and Darius claimed the throne. Since Darius claimed to the throne seemed weak, many opportunists throughout the empire launched separate rebellions against him, usually on the basis of a claim to be some of some royal lineage. According to the inscription, the Bahustan inscription, all of these claims were false and the claimants were imposters, whereas Darius was from a line of Achaemenid kings, which is why the god Ahura Mazda gave him victory over all of the rebels. However, many modern scholars believe that Darius was not from the line of kings, though he apparently was an Achaemenid. They also believe that Cambyses did not in fact murder his brother Bardia and that Gomata, therefore, was the real Bardia, who was murdered by the opportunistic and power-hungry Darius. Now, I'm terrible with names, and so I always find this very, very confusing. But we can see mm -hmm. uh, that there's these different theories. These are new theories. So it's called the hoax theory. It says, for proponent, proponents of the hoax theory, see Jack Martin, uh, Balser, and so, so forth. Now, we don't accept the hoax theory. That is, this is a modern historical revisionist theory where they look at history skeptically and they, thousands of years detached from an event, decide what they think really happened based upon um, all kinds of unproven assumptions. It's not usually based on facts. That is, they don't have any facts that would suggest otherwise, other than Herodias's history. And, and of course, some people just accept Herodias, Herodotus as, uh, you know, that what he wrote must be true, even though he has all kinds of things that are just, you know, stories, right? So it would make much more sense to accept this Behustin inscription um, as reality than to to take some theories that we have, you know, 2,500 years later as reality. That would be my view. But, but that gives us the background. So how does that then relate to the lines that we have with false murders? Now, false murders lines up with Bush the second. So we take the election dispute as a parallel to the controversy. That we have with uh, false murders. Is that that that's acceptable, right? We've already addressed that. Now, okay. 
So, uh, and then the other thing, of course, is when we have the rise of Darius, we have seven months for false notice. Now, um, I'm going to give you some dates here. the better place okay so in um, the the document or the website I use livius.org has some good articles regarding this if people want to look into this later because uh, one is it tries to give us a lot of these Babylonian dates now Smyrdas begins his rule March 11th, 522 BC is, is what they give us here. And um, so I'm just going to get this in here. So March 11th, 522 BC. And his reign is going to end on September 29th. Yeah, 522. And, and that's using the Babylonian calendar. He then, uh, that means he's reigned for seven months, and which is 202 days. So that's how long he's going to reign. 202 days. Okay. Now, he, on July 1st, he actually formally becomes king. So, uh, and this is according to the Behustin inscription. So according to that inscription, he's going to begin reigning on March 21st and become king on July 1st. So, put that in here. I know you can't see what I'm doing here. Now, the biblical dates are, uh, well, we're going to use the Babylonian dates. So, this is going to be the 14th day of the 12th month that he becomes king. So, that's March uh, 11th, 522. And it's going to be uh, the ninth day of the fourth month the 9th of Thomas, that he becomes king. That's July 1st. And then, of course, uh, the 10th day of the 7th month <clears throat> that, that he's going to die, right? So how would we, is there any symbols in here that we can use? We have 311, which is going to be 14th day of the 12th month. We have July 1st. That's a symbol of obviously uh, Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month on our calendar, but it's the ninth day of the fourth month on the Babylonian calendar. And then the 10th day of the seventh month, which is gonna be September 29th on our calendar. That's gonna be the end of his reign. So is there anything we can do with these symbols? Or are they symbols? I mean, definitely July 1st is a symbol, but we have, with false murders, we're lining these up with uh, Bush II. We have 9-11, we have the Gulf War, we have the election dispute, and we have, of course, the death of Smyrtis. So that's going to be when Obama comes to power. So we have Darius. So what would we do with, with any of this? Now, uh, one thing about the Buddhist inscription that we find in the Livius.org here, I'll 
I'll switch the screen so you can see this uh, article. <clears throat> um, they have um, an observation here, which I think is rather interesting. It says, although we do best never to trust ancient texts at face value, we may probably believe Darius' story that, Smir that the Smyrtus he killed was indeed a false Smyrtus, someone who did not belong to the Achaemenid dynasty and may have been a Mede by birth. It should be stressed that Darius had the Behistun inscription engraved at a place where no human being could possibly read it. So for it to be a propaganda piece, when it's, it's placed somewhere where nobody can see it, that would, of course, be a pretty poorly planned propaganda. Anyway, only the gods were witness to his claim that he had killed an imposter. Unless we accept the implausible, impl implausible hypothesis that Darius lied to his god, Ahura Mazda, we must believe that he spoke the truth. That is, he's showing this to the god, right? His god, not to man. So, I mean, I guess it's an implausible hypothesis, but most likely we would say that he's what he's telling is the truth. Um, and uh, so there is a, later a Persian named Va Yazdata proclaimed himself king, also claiming to be the real Smyrtus or Bardia. He sees the Persian palace probably at Pasa Gede and was able to subdue Arachosia. One of Darius's general. <laughs> Artavadia, Artavadia defeated his this king on the 24th of May, 521 BC, after he was forced to flee to, to the east. So anyway, there is, uh, at that time, uh, with Darius, we're going to have all these people sort of contending for the throne. Um, and just uh, regarding the name Smyrtus, um, 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 because it's Bardia, but we, we they always talk talk about Smyrtus, right? So, uh, and I always found that confusing, um, but I think Smyrtus is just a name that we've attached to it from some other source. But the Behustin inscription actually calls him Bardia, not Smyrtus. But they keep using this story, this name Smyrtus. And, and that's the name that we've used uh, for a long, long time. So it comes from some Greek source. Because Smyrtus is a Greek name, Bardia is not. That's the Persian name. So is there anything that we can apply here when it comes to Smyrtus? So we have, of course, the disputed election. That part is clear. What about 9-11 in the Gulf War? How would we um, take this history and connect it? I'm trying to understand how we could connect it. I mean, it's logical that we will. But the question that I have, do we have a definition of the names Smyrtus or Bardia? Um, well, I don't. Um, now, so, okay, so I'm just going to read here. It says, according to several ancient sources, Smyrtus was the only one who was strong enough to draw a bow sent to the Persian court by the enemy. The Greek researcher Herodotus, Herodotus says that the enemy was a Kushite king from Sudan. Others state that it was a leader of the nomads living in Central Asia. Another Greek author, uh, Cestius of Snidus, who calls the prince uh, Tano, Tano Archis, says he became a satrap in charge of the northeastern border. 
And when his brother, King Cambyses, was conquering Egypt, someone calling himself Smyrtus rebelled and became sole ruler of the Achaemenid Empire after Cambyses had died of natural causes, right? So, um, so we have all these, this, I mean, we have this name, I guess, you know, try to answer your question. Um, um, uh, I'm trying to look this up. So Smyrtus in Greek. Uh, it's borrowed, so the entomology, it's borrowed from ancient Greek, but it doesn't tell us what it means. Right, so it doesn't give a definition. Um, and then with Bardia, primarily a male name of Persian origin that yeah. means exalted or lofty. Okay, so okay, so we have that with Bardia. We can find that. <laughs> Brother Theodore. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Where does the um, image of the beast fit in all this? Well, the image of the beast is always the period between um, uh, the second and third angels. It's, it's formed before the third angel. It's in connection with the midnight and the midnight cry. Why do you ask? Well, you're doing the decrees. I figured, um, uh, wouldn't it be right after the second angel's mess? Yeah, but but this is not the line of the decrees. This is the line of the three kings plus the four. But still, in every history, I mean, if, if you have an image of the beast, false Smyrtus is this image of the beast. Right. I mean, it's it's in that history, this seven months. But this isn't the Sunday law. I mean, it's it's typifying it. But it's under Xerxes that you see the Sunday law history, the fourth angel arriving. Right. So in Millerite history, do we have an image of the beast formed? Between midnight and the midnight cry. Right, we don't. So it's not a primary symbol that's part of any line. It's a part of a history, but it's not a waymark per se. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because this isn't the Sunday Law history, these three kings. So, so we have in this history, though, we're looking at Bush the second and false Smyrtus as being parallel uh, kings. We have the dispute, the election dispute that happens with Bush second, which is the first major election dispute in our current history. Okay. Obviously, they exist in the past. Well, don't you have a um, don't you have a type of a Sunday law if I did a uh, party church seat? With Artaxerxes? Yes. Yeah, right there where Haman, Haman is. With Xerxes, you do, but that's not, that's the fourth king, so that's the Sunday law. Okay. okay. Right. All right. So, so when we look at Millerite history, so remember how Jeff would, would do that. We would have 9 uh, 11 uh, being. Um, uh, lining up with April 19th, 1844, right? And then you have Midnight, Midnight Cry. And then you would have 
the third angel's arrest uh, arriving, that would be the Sunday law, right? It's the Sunday law in the sense that it's a close of probation. But we don't have a Sunday law in 1844 on October 22. But we're comparing it with our history, right? So when we put it into our history, we would have these way marks, 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. So that, that's the main line that we have to describe our history, which is simply a zoom into the second angel arriving. And that second angel arriving is the angel of Revelation 18, which Ellen White sees as the Sunday law. So when we look at this history here, we look at these three kings, their Millerite history paralleled, leading up to the third angel arriving, but the third angel is joined by the second angel, and that's the history of Xerxes. So we can see that Xerxes and Trump go together in that Sunday law history, right? So the fourth angel arriving is Xerxes. The fourth angel arriving is Trump. If we take the three plus the one, So there's a justification for saying that Trump is part of that Sunday law history that Xerxes is a part of, right? Because we know that the story of Esther typifies the Sunday law and Trump is in that history. Now we, we did study Esther and then we would have to look at that story again, which we're going to do briefly, not in the detail that we did before. But one of the things we know about that story is we have Haman. And Haman is a deceiver, right? That is, Xerxes is deceived. And we have to say, well, when was Trump deceived? So if you're going to look at that typical Sunday law, because it's a type of the Sunday law, in the story of Xerxes, we should be able to see that that history has already happened in our time. That is, the Sunday law that this is typifying has already occurred because it's, it's the Sunday law of the pandemic, right? It's a typical Sunday law. It's not about Sunday, right, the pandemic, but it has characteristics of the Sunday law. And we're saying that that history already occurred though we're still in the midst of it. We're still in part of that history because the players there, Trump and the globalists are still there. And we would have to say that Haman, in a sense, is a globalist, but we have to look at that further to see how we're going to, uh, to address that. Okay. So, so we have 9-11 in the Gulf War. We don't have anything in false murders that particularly ties us to this. So we have this election dispute. Now this is going to be, now remember false murders, he takes uh, the throne, he, that is he has this rebellion while um, Cambyses is in Egypt, right? So Cambyses conquers Egypt in 525, but he's still there for a few years. So while he's gone in 522, False Mertus is then going to take the throne. And then when Cambyses goes back to challenge this, he's gonna die in some kind of freak accident. We don't know exactly what happened, but he dies in an accident. So he's, he's not killed in battle or anything like that. So, so Smyrtus rules during this time. Now, it, it becomes known that false Smyrtus is not Smyrtus or Bardia, that this is Galmata. And so then Darius kills Galmata on the 10th day of the seventh month, and he then becomes the king of Persia. And then a couple of years later, he's going to uh, do the Behustin inscription, which is for the god uh, Hermazda. 
right? So it's not really a propaganda piece unless he's trying to propagandize uh, his God that he believes in. Okay, so that's the history. How do we attach that history to the symbols we have with 9-11 and the Gulf War that we place there? Because we have symbols. We have symbols of uh, when he begins to reign, um, which is July 11th, when he his rebellion occurs, when he seizes the throne, which is March 11th. How would we look at the Gulf War? What is the Gulf War about, symbolically? Okay, so what happens in the Gulf War? What is the Gulf War? Let's just talk about it. So you have the United States and Iraq, right? You're looking for weapons of mass destruction because we have this uh, made up um, intelligence that there's weapons of mass destruction. And of course, there's a dispute whether uh, this was made up on purpose or by the American government, or it was um, just really, they were really bad at getting intelligence. So what is it? What is this Gulf War? So this is the Persian Gulf. Does that have anything to do with Persia? Iraq, does Iraq have anything to do with Persia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, Persian uh, artifacts in, in Iraq. What's that? Yeah, Persian uh, artifacts in Iraq. Yeah. Well, basically, Iraq is Persia. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, so that, I mean, yeah, we're using it here as a symbol, even though you know we can say it's literally Persia. Um, but this is, is a dispute in the Persian Empire. So the, the place where the Gulf War occurs is in Persia. So, so that ties us to the Gulf War as a symbol, right? So the Gulf War, you know, is the Persian Gulf. So, I mean, we could just put in here... Now, why is it called the Gulf War? I think they did it through the ships. Okay. The oh, ships. There's actually a battle in the Persian Gulf, right? Yeah, it's the ships, yeah. Okay. Ships. Yeah. Okay, so, so we have this Persian Gulf War. It's a war dealing with Iraq. It's in Persia. Okay. Now, they brought troops into Iraq, right? Yeah. I remember now, it, yeah. now, even though, you know, I've, I've watched the news and everything, I don't remember. I know that they, they invaded Persia or Iraq, right? Correct. Yeah. I, I don't know how many troops they brought in or whatever. I could look it up, I guess. But we can say that, that this Persian Gulf War must have some relationship because of the fact that it's Persia as a symbol, 
right? So we're not, we're not taking a literal approach to prophecy here, where we're saying, you know, that there's some prophet, because that's what was being done by the evangelicals, right? They would look at the prophecies in, in the Bible and they would try to apply it literally, you know, that Iraq is mentioned in this battle is the Persian Gulf War is directly prophecy. We're not doing that, but we are seeing the symbol of Persia here. In this history of Bush, we have a war in Persia. And so it's a symbol. And it ties us to this history of Persia. Right? Correct. Okay. Now, now 9 11. Now, now why did they attack, attack Iraq? I mean, there was other countries involved. Why were they attacking Iraq in particular? Because was Iraq... Did they have some, uh, did they have some oil interests? Okay. Because was Iraq responsible for 9 11? What was that again? Was, was Iraq responsible for 9 11? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it kind of came out of uh, Iraq. If I remember okay. right. What came out of Iraq? Al Qaeda. Okay, well, but they're not just Iraq. I mean, there's there's lots of oh, Islamists all through uh, that area. Yeah, I think the reason they attacked Iraq is uh, because Iraq invaded Kuwait. No, you're thinking of um, that's well. Yes, but that's going to be under Bush the first that we have Kuwait. So, so what exactly happens with Kuwait? Okay, so what's the connection between Saddam? Saddam invaded Kuwait. That's reasonably where they are. Okay, so let, let's get our history straight. So we have Kuwait. Um, so that's going to be Bush the first. So there's the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Okay, so that's going to happen in uh, August 2nd, 1990. So that's going to be under Bush the first. But they don't invade Iraq during the Kuwait War. Yes. Do they or do they? I know that they they. Uh, well, if I, if I remember my correct, no, history correct. That's why that's a good excuse they gave for going in there. So they they had uh, invaded Kuwait. They invaded Kuwait in 1990 after they basically chase out Iraq, but they don't, they don't invade Iraq in 1990, right? That's gonna be after 9-11 that they invade Iraq. So they have a battle in Kuwait. They do that in 1991. They, they get rid of Iraq from Kuwait, they free Kuwait, but they don't invade Iraq. Now this is a war between Iran and Iraq, so you have the Iran-Iraq war, and Kuwait is initially neutral, and then they um, uh, begin supporting, in 1982, Kuwait along with other Arab states of the Persian Gulf supported Iraq to curb the Iranian revolution. So I remember the Iranian Revolution um, of, you know, basically the late 70s, early uh, 80s. So you're going to have this, uh, you know, the Ayatollah Khomeini and all that stuff. So, so these are, are rather complicated m motivations of why these things happened. 
so so they're they're not going to invade Iraq in that coup, the war in Kuwait. They're just going to oust Iraq from Kuwait. So the Iraq war is from 2003 to 2011. So that has yeah. to do with Saddam Hussein, right? Yeah, that one I think uh, it was uh, the time Saddam Hussein uh, wanted to change whereby selling of uh, crude oil, he said uh, they were not supposed to be using the dollar. Yeah, so, so these are, yeah, so these are all other theories about what happened. So to try to figure out why the war in Iraq happened, the reason given is that they begin this war on terror because of 9-11. Iraq is not responsible for 9-11, but Iraq is still seen as a terror threat. And so they take a proactive stance against uh, terrorism and they get some intel that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. And so that's why the Iraq war begins. It's on March 20th, 2003, when the US joined by the United Kingdom, Australia and Poland launched, launched a shock and awe bombing campaign. Right. So these things I remember, uh, but we sort of kind of, sometimes conflate these stories in our mind. All of these things that happen in the Middle East, they kind of get a little jumbled in our minds, you know, unless we're actually, you know, thinking about these things and paying attention to them. So, um, you know, it's kind of interesting, their estimations on how many Iraqis died in the first three to five years of conflict is anywhere from 150,000 to 1 million. Uh, it's basically a factor of 10, almost. Um, so nobody really knows, I guess, what the real number is. You think you can come to a closer estimate. But anyway, um, So the rationale for the Iraq war, uh, obviously there was a lot of controversy regarding that. Um, so in the lead up to the invasion, I'm reading Wikipedia here, the United States and the United Kingdom claimed that Saddam Hussein was developing weapons of mass destruction and he thus presented a threat to his neighbors and to the world community. Now, of course, they never did find any weapons of mass destruction. And so there is all kinds of theories about what, you know, who was responsible for the misinformation and, you know, what kind of motives were, were done. So we, we can have all kinds of speculations about it. It's really hard for us to know the facts, right? I mean, we can read stuff on the internet. You're going to have all different kinds of views. But the main thing we can learn from this prophetically is that this, uh, this Persian Gulf War, and so whether that's the best name or we just talking about it, the Iraq War, I don't know what's the... Now, so I guess normally the Gulf War is the term used for the one in Kuwait. So we, we would probably call this instead of the Persian Gulf War. See, so even I get these terms mixed up. So we could call this invasion of Persia. How's that? Instead. Because I guess the Persian Gulf War technically is the war in 1990-91. That, that's the term they use there, because it's a war in the Persian Gulf. But this is the invasion of Persia or Iraq. Now, so when it comes to um, Iraq and Iran and Persia, um, 
what exactly, how do we look at um, these two countries, Iran and Iraq? Modern man would separate them because of the division within the Islamic understandings, but these would all be part of one nation as far as the Bible would be concerned. Okay, right. So we have Iraq. Now, Iraq is really sort of Babylon, and Iran would be Persia. I mean, that's the territory they generally inhabit it because Iraq has is Mesopotamia. It has the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now, Iran technically would be the area that was where Persia comes from. Right. So if you look at a map, so let's do this here. Because you know, I've always got these confused. Um, okay, so here is the map. This is just Google Maps. <clears throat> um, you have Baghdad here. I don't know if you can see this when I zoom in. It doesn't make things bigger. But you got Baghdad here. This is the capital of Iraq. Now, Kuwait is this little country down here um, in the Persian Gulf. Right, so this is the Persian Gulf. Okay. So that's this. This, um, this is the Arabian Sea. And they have Dubai right here, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iran, Kuwait, right? So this is the Persian Gulf. And this is going to be why that's the Persian Gulf War is dealing with Kuwait. This is Kuwait City. So this is the territory that Iraq conquered in 1990. They invade Kuwait. And that's going to be about oil. Now, of course, the Americans come in and just like decimate uh, Kuwait <laughs> uh, to get rid of the Iraqis, but uh, that's a whole other story. And then um, you have this border. This is Iran. Now, now technically, Persia, uh, the Persian Empire, the city that uh, I'm trying to see here, it's going to be here. In this area, part of the Persian Gulf, where Daniel is going to be at that river, um, the Ulai. So the Ulai comes into the Persian Gulf somewhere here. You know, they don't have the mod; they have the modern names, not the old names here. Uh, but you can see that these these areas are close to each other. But technically, uh, Iran has the area of Persia. So this would be Persia. This would be Babylon. You can see here is Syria, and um, this area up here would be Assyria, north of Baghdad, right? So this is Babylon, this is uh, Assyria, this is Syria. You have the Jordan. Uh, the Jordan would be uh, the area of that. That's well, it's east of the Jordan River. Part of this would be the territory of Israel, right? So you've got Israel here, uh, the West Bank. That's the West Bank of uh, the Dead Sea here. There's Jericho. So you can see this area, how it, how it looks, right? So over here, we have Iraq and Iran. So this is basically Babylon and Persia. So these are separate king, kingdoms. So so if we're going to talk about the Persian Gulf War, that's going to be in 1990. And that's going to be at the time of the end in our history, 1989. So it's not going to be in the time of Clinton. It's going to be in the time of his predecessor, uh, Bush the I. Um, and then we have the Iranian Revolution. 
in that history uh, preceding uh, that. And then what about Afghanistan? That's over here. This is on the other side of, of Iran. Because uh, so we have, um, so Saddam Hussein, he's going to be from Iraq, but he's going to be hiding in Afghanistan when he's found, right? Yeah, he hides, he hides in Afghanistan, yeah. Yeah, so that means he passed probably through Iraq uh, to get to Afghanistan. I'm not sure exactly how he traveled. Um, oh, you mean, you, you, would you just say Saddam Hussein or did you say... Uh, Saddam, Saddam Hussein. Because he was oh. found in Afghanistan, right? When they killed him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you all got them. When they were the helicopter and special forces. Well, okay. So so we have Saddam Hussein. We also have um, the, the other guy. What's his name? Uh, the guy who was the mastermind behind 9-11. Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. So Osama bin Laden, he was the one where they took the helicopters and killed him, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I got mixed up between the two. <laughs> right. I know. See, that's what I'm saying is, you know, we've lived through this history, at least some of us have, but it kind of gets conflated into one sort of thing, right? So, so we're not even well defined on, on how to understand this history. So I, I think they found Saddam Hussein in a hole in the ground, if I remember correctly. Well, Saddam Hussein was hiding in Iraq when they found him. He was hiding in Iraq, not in, in Afghanistan? No. Okay. That was a bin Laden that was in Afghanistan. Okay. See, so, Saddam was in Iraq. Okay, so he was hiding in Iraq. So yeah. bin Laden was hiding in Afghanistan. Okay, that makes sense. So, um, so we, we definitely need to brush up on our own history of like recent events. These are pretty recent, so so we conflate these two stories together, at least I do. Um, so if we're going to take this war, then of the invasion of Iraq, um, how do we relate that then? So we're going to say the invasion not of Persia but of Iraq, because Iraq is Babylon. Okay, so now I'm getting our, our history correct. So that's, that's what we're going to have is the second angel arriving. So if I go back here to this. So now we've got the invasion of Iraq, not, not the Persian Gulf War. So is this helping us at all? Or are we digging a hole like uh, Saddam Hussein did? Starting to clarify things. Or, or... Okay. So, so we know we have 9-11. So, so we have the war on terror, right, which is going to result in the invasion of Iraq. Um, So, so to try to connect this history, how we're going to look at 9-11 in the history of false murders, you know, there's, we still have questions. So we can see some things fit, but some things we're not really sure about. How we're going to take false murders' history and, um, and parallel this. So one is, I don't know if we understand our history well enough or even false Smyrtus's history well enough to, to say what's here. But we do have the symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month. And we do have the election dispute. Those two things parallel. But if we're going to put 9-11 as the formalization and the Iraqi invasion 
as its empowerment, how can we relate this to Persian uh, history? Now we know, of course, um, that Persia at this time has conquered this entire area, right? Because the Persian Empire at its height, um, what what does it occupy? So I'm gonna find here. Because it's gonna also have Egypt. And it's gonna reach its heights um, really in the time of Darius. So the Achaemenid Empire. So it's going to it's going to occupy Egypt, Lydia, uh, basically all this area, of course, of Iran, plus Mesopotamia, you know, Babylon, plus uh, the whole Syria, the Levant, Jordan. They don't occupy Arabia, um, and then they're going to have uh, you know the whole area of Turkey. Um, all the way up into Macedonia and Thrace. So basically the southern uh, coast of the Black Sea, the southern part of the Caspian Sea, and basically almost all of the Mediterranean except uh, the western part of the Mediterranean. So that's the Persian Empire. Um, I'll just show you this here so you can see it. Oops. Okay, so this is the Persian Empire. So you can see that it does include uh, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, uh, Phoenicia, Cilicia, Amphilia, all these areas, uh, Phrygia, Lydia, Thrace, Macedonia, Armenia, Babylonia, Bactria, uh, Kosia, Pers Persia, Jedrosia, which I've never heard of, this area down here, and Parthia. Right, so it's all of this area. This is the Persian Empire at that time. So it does include uh, this part of the Persian Gulf, basically the eastern and northern part of the Persian Gulf. Arabia is still going to have this area on the southwestern part of the Gulf, Persian Gulf. <clears throat> okay, because this is basically all desert. This is all arable land. So Arabia gets all the bad stuff. But anyway. Um, so this is the kingdom. So we can see it does include Persia, uh, or not Persia, but Babylon, right? So Persia includes Babylon, right? Technically, this area between the Euphrates and the Tigris, they have labeled as Mesopotamia. It just means between the two rivers, right? And Babylonia is going to be in the southern part uh, where you have Baghdad. In Iraq, right? Okay. So does this still does this help us to understand that this Iraqi invasion includes an area that is part of the Persian Empire, right? So it still connects us to yes. Persia. Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. Now in our time, they're more divided, but back in the time of. Uh, False Myrtus and Darius, these these were part of this huge empire. Now, now Cyrus is the one who really 
like establish the Persian Empire. Um, but under Darius, it reaches its height. Right? And uh, the capital here is going to be, uh, well, I guess one of the capitals is down, going to be down in the Persian Gulf as well. So you got Susa there and Ecbatana. They're in that area. So where, does the United, where does the United States fall into that? You know, it's a dragon power. Um, United States. Well, they didn't exist at that time. Well, I mean, not here, and not. I'm, not, I'm talking modern times. Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if you put the United States as um, in in our time, we're we're, we're taking our, the United States in our being, time. Yeah. We're taking the United States as being Persia, in the sense that it's the two horned power that arises right. in, in Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The dragon. So, yeah. Right. So that's why we're paralleling the kings of Persia with the, the American kings, right? Right. So, but what we're saying is that when we're dealing with what America does, that's why we're not going to take this literally. We're not going to take the invasion of Iraq, you know, as that this is prophecies regarding Babylon, right? You know, we wouldn't go to Revelation and say, you know, the Babylon there is Iraq. That would be interpreting it uh, literally. But what we can say is that the symbols that are here in what happens in 9-11 are dealing with this period of false smyrnas in which we have an imposter uh, ruling in Babylon. Right. So it's, it's just paralleling that history. The symbols are what we are looking at. We're not looking at, we're not looking at a parallel history. We're just looking at the symbols that are provided for us to say, can we tie false Murtis with Bush the second? And it appears to be it appears to be be that way for sure. <laughs> yeah. So so exactly how we do that, that's what we're not certain about. Yeah. Because this is not the United States against, you know, Persia. This the United States is Persia in this in this line. That these are the kings of Persia. But definitely there is a dispute that's occurring in the time of false murders. So so the way that I would do it is I would, you know, in just and I shouldn't say as a guess, but just with what we have right now, is we have uh, the first day of the seventh month. That is going to be when uh, False Murtis becomes the king of Persia, technically, right? So that's July first. So it's not the it's not the first day. It's it's going to be the whatever it was the ninth day of the fourth month um, so maybe I could put that there as well the ninth day of the fourth month <clears throat> okay so that's the Babylonian calendar so I could put this is Babylonian and this one as June okay so we make that okay make sense yes yeah, seems to Okay, and then we're going to have this invasion of Iraq symbolize the recognition uh, by Darius that this is an imposter. Okay, so this is just that history addressing, uh, we'll just say, uh, you know, The deception is uncovered. Now, of course, uh, originally Darius is going to believe that this is Bardia or Smyrtus, um, like other people do. But somehow they discover that uh, this is not Bardia, that this is an imposter. 
named Gawamata. Okay, so can we line that up with the invasion of Iraq? Because here, there is deception involved. Uh, the reason for even evade, invading Iraq. And then we have Obama come into power, or Darius. And that's going to be the third angel arriving, right? That's going to be the tenth day of the seventh month. Does this, does this satisfy people a little bit more? It adds, adds a little more to it, I think. Okay. So some of these things have fallen into place really nicely. Some things we've had to struggle with, mostly because of our lack of knowledge. Right. So, so obviously we need to brush up on our uh, relatively current events you know, within the last uh, 40 years because we're a little rusty. But, but I, I think this, that this makes sense as a line, that we can look at this history of uh, Bush because he's going to, at 9-11, we can say that Bush comes into power. So there's this election dispute. But when 9-11 happens, does Bush now become a popular president? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, he, he's he's one of the most popular presidents since I don't know when. He, he's very very popular after nine eleven. The Americans really rally around Bush initially, right? Now they start, you know, and because I mean it was a pretty shocking event, nine eleven. It's an attack on America. Every everybody's patriotic in America. Um, there isn't a lot of voices speaking against America. America is very united when it's attacked at 9-11. Okay. But then we have this uh, war on terror, and it's going to result in this deception that goes on. Right? So this deception is uncovered after the invasion of Iraq. They don't find mass weapons of mass destruction. And so that would, uh, that's going to be where the popularity of, of Bush's government goes down, and that allows for the rise of Obama, Darius, Darius the Great. And so we have this 10th day of the seventh month symbol from uh, that history, September 29th, 522, but we're going to tie it to Obama. So Obama is this new time or new era that arises in the United States. And really, without Obama coming into power, I don't think Trump could have come into power. It is if, if Obama had if we had had a more moderate, and Obama in some ways is a moderate president, uh, in some ways, but in other ways he's quite radical. And, and definitely connected with the globalist agenda. Uh, Trump uh, comes into power because of course, they're gonna put Hillary as the leader of the United States, which is about the stupidest thing the Democrats could have done is choose somebody that's so hated uh, by men. Nobody likes Hillary Clinton. Very few men do. And a lot of women don't like her either. And, and so, you know, obviously that's another history. That's going to be the fourth angel arriving. So we'd have to look at that when we look at Xerxes. But as far as this 3-1 combination, we can see that we can put this on a line. That this is a zoom into some way mark on the line above it. 
we haven't decided what line above it it is, but it's in the line of the decrees. So what way mark in the line of the decrees this is a zoom into? I don't know. It could be a zoom into uh, Darius, so the third angel. Sometimes we often zoom into the second angel's way mark, so that would be Darius. So we have that as the third angel. Okay, Any anything else that we should note before we close with prayer? Well, I think we'll stop there. We're stopping a little bit early, which is not common, but I'm satisfied that this makes sense. So it's a zoom into Darius's history. That's what I think we're zooming into, the second angel on the line of the decrees. Um, but we know this is tied to Daniel. Obviously, this is from Daniel chapter 11. So it's going to give us this history that's in the scriptures of truth. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit more uh, tomorrow morning. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time here this morning. Um, and we just pray that you can continue to help us to understand this history and our own history and the symbols that are here. Um, we pray for each person who's studying these things, that you can give us wisdom and understanding in our personal study and that we can bring these uh, to this study. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.